Good afternoon and welcome to the May 24th uh, Kiwanis Club meeting. Um, if you will, please uh, stand and join me for our invocation and our pledge. So um, we'll begin. Um, let us pray. This next week, we pause to reflect on the sacrifices made by those who paid the ultimate price on behalf of our nation. We pray that their sacrifices are never forgotten, nor is the pain of their families. We acknowledge that freedom comes at a cost and pray that we can pursue peace. Let us turn to you, Lord, in our grief and in our remembrance of the fallen. Guide us towards a harmonious existence as we honor those who are willing to give their lives so that we may gather here today freely. As we approach Memorial Day, we pray for peace and for those who gave all. Lead us towards a world where no one must give their lives in the pursuit of freedom. May we be receptive to your guidance, and may we never forget the fallen. Bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies to your service. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'm trying to record people as they're coming in too to make sure they're entered in for the attendance prize. And I have everyone who is um, online uh, slips as well. Okay, I um, want to welcome everyone here today. We have a lighter crowd. I think a lot of people um, have already kicked off a summer plans. I know I'm leaving for vacation as soon as we're done here. So eat fast. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm glad to have everyone here. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on the email that I sent out. Um, I think it's been a little, maybe almost two weeks ago just to make sure everyone um, knows what our plans are for the rest of the fiscal year. I send a lot of emails, so I'm not sure how closely everyone reads um, each of them, so I want to make sure everyone knows this. Um, we have decided um, to, the, the leadership and the board of directors have decided to continue our current arrangement of dues at $50 a quarter, and that will cover our na national and state dues. And we're going to keep charging $15 per meal for members who have come um, in person. We will be doing this through September uh, 2021. So that's our um, fiscal year. And then um, we will continue to meet in this space. So no more switching back and forth. We have this space. Um, and um, we realize that there are people who are ready to go back um, to the River Room and the leadership is very aware of that and wants that to happen. Um, but there are a couple reasons why we can't. Um, right now they're not allowing food and we're a lunch and meal or uh, meeting. And then the other issue is cost. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were paying $500 for the River Room. 
Um, North Augusta is giving us a wonderful deal on this room because they had to move us from the community center. They're only charging us $150. So no, that no. is... really kind of price point we need to be at right now. So I just want to make sure everyone knew that. If anyone has um, any questions about that, um, please make sure you see me or Lowell or another um, member of uh, the board and we'd be happy to answer um, your questions about that. Okay, uh, I want to share a thank you note that we got in the mail uh, Nathan, from his name is Martha uh, St. Mary on the Hill. They said, on behalf of the students and family at St. Mary on the Hill Catholic School, we would like to thank the Kiwanis Club's Bryce Newman Scholarship Fund for the $2,000 grant to support need-based scholarships at our school. This grant will be um, tremendous assistance to our family and support a child coming to our school. Again, thank you for your group support. So for those of you who don't know, we have several name scholarships that go directly to certain schools and the Bryce Newman um, goes to St. Mary on the Hill. Okay, uh, let's see. Today in history, the Brooklyn Bridge, a suspension bridge spanning East, the East River from Brooklyn to Manhattan was a brilliant feat of 19th century engineering. Since its construction, the bridge has become an essential landmark in New York City, an outstanding architectural accomplishment that is still revered across the world. The masterwork of John Augustus Roebling, the Brooklyn Bridge was built in the face of immense difficulties. Roebling, an engineer, had developed his own method for weaving wire cables, which became one of the leading constructural components of his bridge design. He died at the beginning of the construction as a result of an accident at the site. And so his son, Washington Roebling, um, took over construction of it, but he suffered a crippling attack of decompression sickness. And so he ended up being confined to his apartment in Brooklyn, but he continued to direct the operations through the help of his wife and observing through field glasses, sending messages to her through looking through his field glasses. Um, a compressed air blast wrecked um, the pneumatic caisson and slowed the work as did a severe fire that smoldered for weeks and a cable parted from its anchorage on the Manhattan site and crashed into the river. And there was a fraud perpetuated by a steel wire contractor that necessitated the replacement of tons of cable. Sounds like government work today. Um, at least 20 workers were killed during its construction and many more suffered from that decompression sickness. The Brooklyn Bridge spans almost 1,600 feet and it was the longest in the world when it was constructed. The towers are built of limestone, granite, and cement. Its deck is supported by four cables and carries automobiles and pedestrian traffic. A distinctive feature is the broad promenade above the roadway, which John Grobling accurately predicted in a crowded commercial city will be of incalculable value. Upon its completion, his wife rode the first carriage across the Brooklyn side, carrying a rooster as a symbol of victory. The bridge's opening day was May 24th, 1883, and was marked by much celebration and attended by the United States President Chester Arthur. The building has become a landmark and technological achievement for a generation. Okay, so yes, awesome. Cameron is bringing up our attendance prize. We started a little earlier today. Um, and for those of you who are wondering about that, we're committed to that. Great, thank you. Um, and the reason why our, we're, we've been brainstorming as a board of how to get more people to attend, but we also um, have, we're sensitive to some of our members who work full time and who need um, to, sorry, I'm trying to manage several things. Um, I've, someone from the chat on online has asked everyone to mute themselves. So if, you, if you're online and you're not muted, if you could do that. So anyway, we moved it to 12 because we 
some of the people that work full time said it would be easier for them to take that lunch hour um, from noon to one. So that's going to be what we're going to be doing moving forward. And again, if you came in late or joined us late, we're going to be in this space um, through September. So we have now our attendance prize. I want to thank Cameron Nixon for the donation of the attendance prize. It is a $15 gift card to um, Whitehorse. So you can go out and buy yourself some wine or beer or whatever strikes your fancy. And I'm going to ask our speaker to choose a name. That's Kyle's next. Okay, Cameron, you can't win your own. Sorry. We thought you had beaten the system. Okay, we have an online winner. This is for annual. I will um, get this in the mail to you and um, soon. So, congratulations on winning the attendance prize. Okay. Um, Derek, are we ready? Okay. Um, now what we are going to do is induct a new member to our club, which is always very exciting. And so Derek May, the sponsor of the new member, is going to come up and introduce um, our new member. Thanks, Martha. And thanks, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome uh, Sherry Sanders to our club. Uh, Sherry's a, a long, let's see, make sure the people on the screen can see her too. Sherry's a longtime uh, friend, of, friend of mine and her, she and her husband, friends of my wife Tara and I go way, way back. She worked together with me at the Chronicle for many years like, uh, like James Holmes, who recently joined as well. So uh, we're picking off Chronicle folks now. Um, Sherry uh, is with Blanchard and Calhoun, great, great person. Glad to have her as a member of our club. So please help me welcome uh, Sherry, Sherry Sanders. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry, and welcome to the club. Yeah, they. Okay. Um, they I like am going battle. to get the PowerPoint for our speaker ready to go and turn over the program to our president elect, Troy Lanier, to introduce. Well, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, our speaker today is Dayton Shiraus. A lot of you know Dayton. Just would give you a little bit of background information. Uh, since 1998, Dayton has served as the executive director of the Augusta Canal Authority and the Augusta Canal National Heritage Area. So he's been in that position for over 20 years. Prior to joining the Augusta Canal Authority, he worked as president of Planning Research and Management Associates, a Georgia planning firm. He's also served as executive vice president of Augusta Tomorrow, and he was county administrator for Richmond County. Uh, he's held a number of other positions in public service. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Florida State. <clears throat> Dayton currently serves on a variety of boards for different uh, civic organizations here in town. And he is going to give us an update on the Augusta Canal. Please, please give a warm Kiwanis welcome to Dayton Shiraus. How do you get out of this thing? Uh, you did. That should be good. All right, thank you. Uh, well, well, it's a pleasure to uh, be, be with you today. I, I, I'm normally a walker <laughs> and, uh, in terms of, you know, I can't. Uh, with the crowd that uh, I'm talking to, but uh, we set apart from the. Yeah, I'm going to have to be tied to this to address it. Uh, it looks it like it has like timings on it. To get back it's, to it's doing it itself. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Park. <laughs> All right, what I want to do is uh, bring you up to date. I always try to 
to give a little bit of history out because I find out that people don't really even though they may be from Augusta, uh, they don't really understand the history, not made necessarily the city or the canal. <clears throat> but as you may know, Augusta was the second oldest city in, in Georgia, uh, behind Savannah and uh, General Oglethorpe was going to crew up the river to establish a trading post and uh, they came as far as they could up the river and they cantered the shoals in the river and they got out and built Fort Augusta, which is basically where St. Jason to St. Paul's Church now, but uh, it's long since been gone, but it was not a military uh, post, uh, it, was a, it was a trading post to uh, intersect the Indian trade that came across here, uh, and they, the reason they came here is they could cross the river in, on the Shoals area and get across particularly in dry conditions almost without getting their feet wet by walking across, and that, they wanted to intersect the trade. Uh, intercept the trade uh, uh, coming out of the interior of the country before it went into South Carolina. And the city prospered for the first hundred years or so, but then several things happened. Other cities were founded like Atlanta, and, uh, <clears throat> Macon, and Columbia, Columbus, and um, plus the railroad uh, had just been finished in 1845 uh, to connect Augusta to Atlanta. And uh, <clears throat> Henry Cumming, who was the um, son of the first mayor of Augusta, uh, had traveled a lot. He was an attorney and he traveled a lot. And he observed that the um, uh, economy was doing great in the northeastern cities with uh, something called the textile industries. Where, and so he said, well, the, the cotton they're getting, uh, they're buying it from the South because uh, the South was known as King Cotton. And says, why don't we move the, the, the textile the industry closer to the raw product, I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, cotton here. And it was really part of a bigger movement at the time in the South called Southern Nationalism to make the South less dependent on Northern industrialists. Uh, and uh, so he had this idea of building the canal pattern after the one in Lowell, Massachusetts. And um, uh, he, uh, at his own expense, uh, did the initial surveying and uh, observed that we could produce more power off the Santa River than they could up in the uh, Allegheny River up in, uh, in Massachusetts. And Augusta, uh, of course, then started building textile mills, and at that time, there was no electricity, 1845. And so you had to locate the plant physically to where the power, and the power was water. And the reason we can have power from water here is the, from basically where the the head gates start up in Columbia County. Um, the river drops 52 feet in elevation from there to downtown in, in Augusta. The canal running alongside of it only drops three feet. So that differential creates the head that you can run water out of the canal into turbines and create hydro, at that time, hydromechanical, not hydroelectric. Uh, the, uh, the water turned the water wheels and it turned shafts that were connected directly to the looms and, and they operated hydromechanically until right after 1900. And uh, that was beginning the decline of the canal to some degree because after electricity, if you wanted to build a plant, you didn't have to locate on the canal any longer. You could locate five miles away and the power company would run the lines out to you. And so the canal kind of foundered a little bit and, uh, and uh, after that until, um, um, got the idea that we really could do something to improve it or bring it back as an economic factor once again. Um, it was greatly enlarged in 1875, and originally it was only um, 40 feet wide and about uh, seven or eight feet deep, and but it didn't provide enough power for the for the mills that are located here. So it was enlarged greatly by 1875. A new lock was built uh, up at the head gates and the canal was widened to a minimum of 150 feet wide and 12 feet deep. And um, part of that, the impetus for doing that was some of the existing factories that built here originally sued the city because they weren't getting enough water to, to create the power that they needed. Um, but it was built for three purposes. The main purpose of building the canal was for uh, power production, but secondarily it was built for transportation because um, with the canal, you could, you could lock around those shoals in the river. If you were coming down the river, you'd lock into the canal and come down to offload at 13th Street 
where the cotton was in, then transported to the mills or offloaded on wagons that went down the river and it was shipped on uh, to Savannah. And at the very end, uh, when it was being done, the city said, well, we need a source of public water. And so that was added as the third purpose. And Augusta had one of the first public water supply systems in the country uh, dating back to 1855. And the original plant was where the Sears Roebuck used to be at uh, Walton Way at 15th and now MCG or Augusta University is located there. But that was the original site. And then it was moved up to behind National Hills on the canal. Uh, in 1899, and it still operates without any electricity today. The water that's pumped out of the canal by the utilities department, four miles up to Daniel Village for the treatment plant, is done hydromechanically. The pumps are tied directly to the shaft of the turbine, and it powers the water pumps that pumps out water up to the treatment plant at, uh, at Daniel Village. So it saves the, the city, or particularly utilities, a, a great deal of money. Uh, the canal has all kinds of de historic designations. Uh, another coming uh, had it put on the National Register. Of course, he couldn't do it, but he did the work to get it done. Uh, it was in, in uh, 1977, and then uh, it was designated as a National Historic Landmark in, in uh, 1979. And in the state of Georgia, the Department of Community Affairs designated it as a, a call an RIR, a regionally important resource, uh, in 1996. And as of today, that's still the only one in the state of Georgia. Uh, and then <clears throat> Congress declared it a National Heritage Area in 1996. And then just two years ago, it was designated as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark. Uh, a little bit of who we are. Uh, the canal was created, a canal authority was created by an act of the General Assembly of Georgia in uh, uh, 1989. And um, uh, the really the reasoning for doing that was uh, Riverwalk was just beginning to get done. And, and uh, Hugh Connolly, who was on the board for um, uh, Augusta Tomorrow at that time, made the observation, well, all this interest on the Riverwalk in downtown Augusta, we got another waterway that's kind of neglected in Augusta, and that was the canal he was talking about. So um, uh, the legislation was drawn up and, and passed by the uh, General Assembly uh, in, uh, of Georgia to create a canal authority, and at the time, it was only five members. And um, uh, then after consolidation, the city wanted to have a, a, an appointee for each commission district. And so uh, the legislation, we drew it up to enlarge it, double it, and take it to 10. And then the legislative delegation, when they got it, said, well, that's fine. If you're going to do 10, let's do 12, and we'll add, we'll appoint two people. So we get our board is made up of 12 members, 10 by each of the commissioners, and then two by uh, the um, legislative delegation. And um, we're uh, affiliated with the National Park System. And uh, we're only, as of today, we're on one of 55 in the United States. Uh, when we were designated in 96, there were only 18, but it's still pretty elite company when you talk about uh, you know, the, the entirety of the United States, only 55 national heritage areas. One thing people don't understand or misunderstand, they assume we're a department of the city, which we're not. We're a state created authority. Uh, our only tie to the city is, is the appointments made to our board by the city commission. And then also the most of the work that we do, the capital projects we do are on city property. Uh, we own some property, but the canal itself and property on each side of it is on, still owned by the city of Augusta. Um, of course, if you, most people, uh, uh, I think, here today know where it starts, but up in Columbia County is where the headgates are, the Columbia County Rapids Pavilion, you know, sets up on the knoll, and uh, if you look down below, you'll see these gates where the water backs up in the river and, and flows uh, into the canal, and um, and the dam you see in the background is, is owned by the city and it backs the water up and sends it back through the gates to um, get in the canal. Uh, and also find out people don't really understand maybe what we do all the time. So uh, uh, we, we built two Petersburg boats uh, back in 2000. Uh, uh, 
They are authentic uh, replicas of the original Petersburg boats that brought cotton and tobacco down the river and the canal to market in Augusta. Uh, we, we got a grant to build those, uh, but we couldn't get anybody to build them yet. Every time I told them we had a DOT grant to pay for part of it, uh, boat builders uh, didn't deal with all the paperwork and stuff they had to do. So we could never get, we bid it twice and didn't get a, a bidder. So they allowed us to act as the general contractor and we subbed it out to a guy uh, down in Tommy Island who builds historic boats. And um, uh, he hired the people and we rented a warehouse in Tabi and we bought all the materials direct and uh, paid those people and uh, we built them in a warehouse. The first one was a mold for the second one. So it's the second one slightly smaller because the mold uh, was based on the first one. And uh, they have been very popular. Uh, we give historic tours uh, on the canal, guided tours. And then uh, during the prime uh, spring, uh, fall, we, we do his, uh, music tours on Friday and Saturday night. And, uh, and like I say, we have guides aboard that uh, give a historic tour. Um, and of course, we got a trail system, which is uh, very popular. And uh, um, you know, on the upper end of it, it's natural. Uh, I tried to pave a portion of it one time, and I about got tarred and feathered. And uh, people, that, particularly the joggers, want to run on that natural service. They, they don't want a, a, a paved asphalt or concrete. So we grew from the pump station basically up to the head gates in Columbia County is, is, is natural. The ones we're doing now off that in town, uh, those are paved. Um, we also, uh, we operate the hydroelectric plants at the three mills, uh, Enterprise Mill, Team Mill, and Simba Mill. And that, that provides the bulk of our operating income. We, 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 we own two of them, uh, Sibley and King, and then uh, Enterprise. So we don't own it, but we have had an operating agreement with the owners since uh, 2000 that we do all the maintenance and we get all the revenue off of. We sell the power back uh, to the tenants uh, in, in, in all three locations uh, below market and then we sell the excess to uh, Georgia Power. We're tied to the grid. And then uh, we do a lot of trail work. If you open, go along the river, uh, between the river and um, Ribwash Parkway, the major extension we've been doing there for a couple of years, uh, uh, that's the, uh, the tail race that comes out of King Mill into the river and it's a cable suspension bridge. Uh, it's got a little bit of movement on it because it's no, 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 uh, you see, they don't see any columns in, in underneath it in the water. So it's anchored on each side and it's got cables as you can see that go across and I think you got to go to the mountains in North Georgia before you can find another one uh, in this part of the country. Uh, we also do a lot of historic renovation. This church right here is uh, the, the historic CME Trinity Church, and uh, it's a mother church with a, that denomination. And uh, it started out at St. John's, uh, and uh, where the free and black slaves worshiped at St. John's Methods uh, from the 1840s until about the 1880s. And then the, the, the congregation wanted to build their own, and so they moved over to 8th Street. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, there was a lot of soil contamination from the, when the gas company operated a coal-fired uh, gas plant over there for uh, 100 years, and uh, it contaminated the soil, and the gas company wanted to tear the church down. Uh, they bought the church from the congregation, and they built a new one out on Glen Hills Drive, and but we uh, decided it could happen. Uh, we wouldn't let it happen, and unfortunately, I guess we, we came beyond it. And uh, moved it across the street uh, where it sits now. And uh, we're trying to raise the money to renovate it for some type of a community center for the neighborhood at the present time. And then, of course, the other part of that slide is the uh, <coughs> King Mill and, and Sibley Mill, which are we're under development at the, at the current time. And hopefully, you're going to see construction started on apartments at King Mill within a few weeks. Um, we also have a very active education program. We do about 9,000 students a year through our center. And uh, um, 
we offer uh, the uh, curriculum for uh, K through 12 grades on our uh, website, and the teachers can just download that, bring them down, get a school bus, and bring them down and turn turn them over to us, and and we do anything from from historic uh, uh, emphasis to uh, ecology and. Uh, we uh, all set up the children can get water samples out of the canal and go to our classroom and do water testing for a variety of things, so hands on, which they really like. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, one of the uh, less elaborate things we do is maintenance related, but it's necessary. Uh, uh, during the, uh, particularly during high winds or storms, we get a lot of trees and limbs down across the trails which we've got to go clean out and then uh, periodically we've done some major dredging on the canal uh, the last time we did it was in uh, 2000 and uh, we removed a lot of, of, of uh, accumulated uh, uh, sediment that was in the canal we're continuing to expand the trail system the one we just opened up officially in october of last year was uh, from Turn this uh, west of Hawks Gully all the way down to 13th Street to tie into Riverwalk. Uh, we had to come across the uh, Hawks Gully uh, gate structure, but to do that, we had to come down the face of the levee. So you see a major uh, boardwalk there that uh, we had to build to get it down uh, back down to uh, street level. Uh, a lot of activities, uh, people like to walk the dog on the canal, uh, they like to canoe or kayak. Uh, and uh, but it's a very popular spot for, for you know, people that come not only local people we get people from uh, come through the discovery center from all over the united states and internationally as well but a lot of things i've always uh, been asking you know what can i do and i said well be a visionary and a leader to make, make customs a better place uh, um, henry cumming uh, who had the idea of building the canal in the first place uh, when he was honored by the city council um, after the uh, construction of the canal. And uh, Henry Cummings said something that we all should live by every day, at least in my estimation. And he said it ought to be the, uh, uh, an honor for, to, for every citizen to do something for the public good. And uh, so he didn't do it, he didn't do it for uh, payment of anything, but other than try to make the city a better place. And I think we're lucky today that we still have a canal because a lot of a lot of cities are trying to find things that set them apart from everything else. The river here is very important for us, obviously, both sides of the river. But the canal has been there since 1845, and uh, it, it brings a lot of people to Augusta. And uh, as a, it been a, you know, I've I, I told people a, a long time ago that I'm biased, but I think had the canal not been built, Augusta could have physically drawn, died, uh, just died because the, in the 1830s, the population was cut in half, people were leaving. And then after the canal, it, it doubled, it was open and uh, it was a place for come to work and uh, throngs of farmers and people that lived in the, uh, out in the country moved into the city because they could find work at the mills and it really gave them the, uh, city of boosting the arm economically after the canal opened up. So I'll stop there and uh, maybe respond to any questions or give you an opportunity to, uh, to ask any questions. I don't have a question, but I would like to tell you a little story about uh, how <laughs> Dayton has always been, has always tried to make Augusta a better place. 35 years ago? 1980. 1980. Dayton was Port Authority? Yeah, one of them, thank you. Dayton was on the Port, that was Port Authority, and the weather man predicted some severe weather heading our way. River was going to rise to unprecedented levels. Dayton in his foresight, realized that if the docks at the Fifth Street Marina rolled to the level that the weatherman had predicted the river to rise, we were going to lose our docks because they're on islands and they obviously float. They got the city all stirred up and probably in 72 hours or less. <coughs> 
they managed, he managed to convince them to bring segments down to the ground <coughs> and weld them to the existing pipes. So every time you go about the Fifth Street Marina, you can think of Satan Charette. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, you may have answered this previously, so I apologize. Where does money come from to build it originally? To do the marina? No, no, no. no. Because the canal, well, yeah. it's a long answer, but I'll, I'll shorten it and try to. Um, they, were, they issued script, uh, which was like <laughs> stock certificates and originally, and uh, you got script percentage of your property to the total taxable property city at the time. And um, um, there, I've still got some copies of that around that, uh, that show that. But, you know, Augustus uh, can be a <coughs> lawsuit happening place at times. <laughs> But uh, so uh, a group of citizens got together and sued and said that was a illegal taxation or I don't know the basis of the suit, but it went all the way to the Supreme Court, but it was upheld. And then um, later on, um, uh, that was, uh, it actually was taken over by the city and now operated under a city commission for a number of years. And then later on, it uh, just became a part of the, uh, um, or part of the Augusta Utilities Department, but the original money was uh, was uh, based on the scripts that were issued and taxes collected for the construction originally, and then uh, the city just did it out of the general fund, I guess, as part of the expansion between 1845, 1847, and 1875. <clears throat> This is a little bit off topic, top, off topic, but <clears throat> somewhere I've read that Georgia had a very vibrant canal system in different parts of the state to move goods around that was operational for a number of years. Do you know anything about that? Really more across, well, I said across the river, I'm across the river. Yeah, right now. <laughs> uh, there, there was a system right here uh, dated uh, uh, really a little bit earlier than our canal, I ran in that area. And uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina had a uh, canal system uh, designed by Byron Holly, who did the one for Augusta. He did the one for there in Roanoke, Virginia. But um, I, I'm not familiar with any other, in like in Columbus, uh, Georgia, uh, they had a pretty thriving textile industry there, but it was. It was uh, just utilizing the water off the river, and I don't think they ever had a canal system per se like ours. And, uh, uh, but uh, up in the Northeast, most of them were transportation canals. They were a lot shallow and narrow than our canal because it was strictly for transportation. Ours was primarily built for, for power, so it was bigger and deeper. No other questions, I appreciate the opportunity to get out and use the canal. I just want to say, I want to take a lead from Dodson and tell a, a Dayton story. Uh, I grew up in Lake Stone, Lake Augustette area, and uh, I first started riding the canal trail when I was six years old. That's 66 years ago. And I still ride it two to three times a week, every week, and I've been doing that for those 66 years. But to say that I know that canal trail, well, it's more than the back of my hand. I had logged literally thousands of miles on it. And for most of my career, my life was on that trail, it was the same old thing until Dayton and his people came along. He started developing the improvement trail. And what you've done, connecting the bridges and connecting it to downtown where you now can go to 13th Street, cross over the bridge, go to ride the Greenway, where a back and then, I mean, it's, it is one of the most fabulous bike trails. And I just, it, I can't do it enough, and I can't thank you and your people enough for doing that and making it happen. Thank you. We've spent about $30 million uh, on improvements on the canal since uh, uh, the Canal Authority was created in uh, 1989. And again, uh, the 
as I said before, we don't get any money from the city. Uh, we have to generate all our money, own money, operational and capital. And unfortunately, this last sales tax extension that was voted on by the voters, uh, and the commission and their infinite wisdom decided not to include any funding for the canal authority. And we, we've received capital funding since the first um, split of special purpose local option sales tax state back to around 1998 or 99. And uh, so this one now uh, uh, did not include, we could use all of that capital money for matching grants. So uh, unless we can identify some other sources of money, we'll probably cut back on some of our projects uh, because uh, of uh, not having any money to match the grants with. But uh, come out and visit with us, it's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for that um, presentation. And we have some Qantas branded gear for you, um, some pins and a phone charger. So okay, if you're caught you. out on the canal and lose your charge, you have, <laughs> have something for you to do that. Okay, um, our next meeting will be June 7th. We're staying on our every other um, meeting schedule every other Monday, although next Monday is Memorial Day anyway, so we wouldn't normally meet. Um, for June 7th, we will be here. Our speaker will be Dr. Cool from uh, University, who's going to be talking about the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we'll also be presenting our um, first installment of our 10-year gift to the Children's Hospital of Georgia um, as a part of our delayed centennial celebration at that meeting so that we'll have someone from the AU Foundation here um, to receive that check. Um, so we hope that you can come um, and join us there. And again, we will meet here at the Palmetto Terrace Room and lunch will begin at noon. So the thought for the week um, goes along with the Memorial Day theme. Um, ceremonies are important, but our gratitude has to be more than visits to the troops and once a year Memorial Day ceremonies. We need to honor the dead best by treating the living well. So everyone, um, have a great week, have a nice Memorial Day, and happy unofficial start to summer. We stand adjourned. <laughs> Learn a lot.